happy Sabbath to everyone. Good to see all of you here, and for all of you listening and watching in on the telecast, happy Sabbath to you as well. My, I'm here with my beautiful wife, Martha. We arrived yesterday, and we have totally enjoyed the day yesterday, spending the afternoon and last evening with Gail and with uh, Scott. Thank you. They're such good friends. Yes. But, <laughs> yeah, what's his name? But uh, we, we are staying here through... Uh, Monday morning when we, or Monday afternoon when we're flying back to Houston. We've uh, enjoyed them immensely, very good friends. We've been friends for many, many, many years and just have enjoyed each other's company very, very much. And uh, again, I say welcome to everyone for Sabbath services today. I, and I appreciate Scott's intro and uh, his message earlier that uh, it my sermon kind of baby backs right on top of that. So he gave pretty much a synopsis of I think my sermon to, or my message today. And uh, so we'll with that we'll go ahead and get started. You know, in many of the world's churches today, many ministers have preached a message that God only wants good things in your life. And God wants to shower you with physical blessings. These ministers say that if you're not receiving these blessings and you're not having good things happen in your life, then that means that you must not have enough faith or you must have done something wrong and that you somehow are not pleasing God. Now, this message is known as the health and wealth gospel which has been very much popularized in today's narcissistic, shallow, and unrighteous society in which we all live. This health and wealth gospel basically not only equates physical blessings with pleasing God, but it actually also adopts a, a direct correlation and link between the amount of physical blessings that you're receiving and the amount that you're pleasing God. They go hand in hand. They're totally linked together. So if you're rich, increased with goods, healthy, successful, and happy, that means you're pleasing God. And conversely, if you're poor, if you're sick, if you're unsuccessful, and you're, if you're unhappy, it's because you are not pleasing God. You're doing something wrong. You have sinned some secret sin and God is punishing you. Something is amiss. Something is wrong with you. Please turn with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. And we'll start off reading the very first verse. You know, Job, as we all know, was smitten with horrible boils all over his body. He lost his entire family except for his wife. He experienced terrible pain and immense suffering. And we read in Job chapter 1 and verse 1 that there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And what do we find out about Job here? And that man was perfect and upright and one who feared God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. He stayed away from evil. Continuing on in chapter 2 and verse 7, we all know the story, but in verse 7 of chapter 2 of Job, we read, And so went Satan. Now in Hebrew, that word is ha-satan. And in Hebrew, it means the adversary. S-A-T-A-N in Hebrew simply means the adversary. It's not his name. It is who he is to God. He is the adversary of God. And so it says, so went the adversary forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto the crown of his head. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. He was totally miserable. 
he was totally afflicted with boils all over his body. And in Job's horrible sickness and in his agony, his three friends came to console him. But as they continued to talk, each of his friends came to the same conclusion, that Job must have sinned a great sin. And he's being punished by God. He's being found out. You must have done something horrible for this to be happening to you. And Job's three friends were wrong, though, in the source of Job's sufferings. Eliphaz the Temanite told Job that the innocent are not punished. And we read this in Job 4 and verse 7. This words of of Eliphaz the Temanite. Job chapter 4 and verse 7. And we read where Eliphaz says, Remember, I pray you, whoever perished being innocent? Or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his nostrils they are consumed. Later on, Bildad the Shuhite told Job that God makes righteous people prosperous in all that they do. We read that in Job chapter 8, beginning in verse 3. Job chapter 8 and verse 3. This is what Bildad said. Does God pervert judgment? And does the Almighty pervert justice? If your children have sinned against him and he have cast them away for their transgression, if you would seek unto God betimes and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, there's the accusation right there, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would await for you and make the habitation of your righteousness prosperous. And then his third friend, Zophar the Namathite, told Job that he must have sinned to be punished like this and that he would stop, he should stop whatever sin that he is committing so he would be healed. We read that in Job 11, beginning in verse 13. So Zophar says, And if you prepare your heart and stretch out your hands toward him, If iniquity be in your hand, put it far away. Stop sinning the sin that's causing this. And let not wickedness dwell in your tabernacles, for then shall you lift up your face without spot. Yea, you shall be steadfast and shall not fear. Now we'll discuss later in the sermon or in this message why Job's three friends were completely wrong in their judgment of the source of Job's horrible predicament that he's in, the suffering that he was enduring at the time. But that belief of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, Job's three really good friends, constitutes a core belief in the churches of today. If you obey God and if you please him, you will always prosper and be physically blessed. And if you do not obey God and do not please him, you will never prosper and you will never be wealthy and healthy. But this simply is not true. This belief is not true. Please turn with me to Psalm 73. It's a psalm of Asaph. And we'll read where Asaph saw and was even envious of the prosperity of the wicked. We read this in Psalm 73, beginning in verse 1. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. Psalm chapter 73 and verse 1. We read a psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping and I was almost gone. For I envied, I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. So the wicked and the unrighteous could be prosperous in this life. And they often are. So the opposite can be true, 
Can the opposite be true? Please turn with me to Matthew 5. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus on the Mount of Olives, on the Mount of on the Sermon of the on the Mount, spoke about this seeming paradox to the multitude that had gathered around him. And this is part of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5 and in verse 44, beginning in verse 44 of Matthew 5, Jesus said these words, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good unto them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. And then in verse 45, that you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. And then what does he say? For his Father makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and his Father sends rain on the just and the unjust. So our Heavenly Father sends the same Son every morning, Every day, each day to shine on the righteous and on the unrighteous. And he sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Both the righteous and the unrighteous benefit and are blessed with the love of our Heavenly Father. Please turn with me to Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And we'll read a very important and crucial concept, principle, and truth. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And we'll read verses 14 and 15. I'll read this out of the New Century Bible. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 14. We read, Sometimes something useless happens on earth. Bad things happen to good people. And good things happen to bad people. I say that this is also useless. So I decided it was more important to enjoy life. And the best that people can do here on earth is eat, drink, and enjoy life. Because these joys will help them do the hard work God gives them here on earth. So today in my message entitled, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? I'd like to explore the subject of bad things, which continue to happen to the called out ones of our Heavenly Father, even when they are being obedient to Him. And I'd like to explore this subject in four points. The first point concerning why bad things happen to good people is point number one, we as called out ones do not live charmed lives. We as called out ones do not live charmed lives. Please turn with me to Ecclesiastes 9. We were right there in chapter 8. It is a biblical principle that time and chance happen to us all. This is in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, beginning in verse 10. It says, Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happen to all of them. Time and chance happens to them all. For man also knows not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as birds that are caught in the snare So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Now please turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, and we'll read about a tragedy that was the big news of the day that Jesus included in his discussion. It killed 18 people. This tragedy 
killed 18 people. This tragedy in the town of Siloam was a major news event that had a long-lasting effect on the people in the region. Made them ask many questions of why this happened. And Jesus referred to this tragedy to make a point. We read this in Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Luke chapter 13 and verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose that you suppose you that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then in verse 4, Or those 18 whom the upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, do you think that they were sinners above all men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You know, the falling of the tower of Siloam was apparently an accident. It was not planned. We don't know why it fell, but when it fell, it killed 18 people who were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Time and chance happened to them all. They had plans. They were going about their business, and suddenly the tower fell on them. Please turn with me to Matthew 4, and we'll explore one of the temptations of Jesus, the anointed one, by our adversary, the devil. We read this in Matthew chapter 4, and we'll begin in verse 5. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 5. We read, Then the devil takes him up to the holy city, taking Jesus up into the holy city, and sets him at the pinnacle of the temple, and says unto him, If you be the Son of God, Cast yourself down, for it is written that he shall give his angels charge concerning you. The Father would give his angels charge concerning Jesus, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a stone. Now, the devil was quoting scripture. If we turn, we'll read this in Psalm 91. The devil was quoting from Psalm 91. Let's turn there. Psalm chapter 91, and we'll begin in verse 1. Psalm chapter 91 and verse 1. We read, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and and under his wings you shall trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day. Nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness and for the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right side, but it shall not come nigh to you. Only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord which is in my refuge, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh unto your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. Here is the quote. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. And you shall tread upon the lion and adder. And the young lion and the dragon shall shall you trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Now, this is what the devil used in a temptation to Christ as a test. 
when he was tempting him. What was Jesus' re- Jesus's response to this temptation? Let's read it in Matthew 4 and verse 7, the very next verse. In Matthew 4 and verse 7, Jesus' simple reply was he quoted scripture back, and Jesus said unto him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Because the devil used this psalm in tempting Jesus, many believe that Psalm 91 was a prophecy about Jesus. And it was applying only about Jesus. But as we read in Psalm 91, we can glean that the psalm is concerning everyone who trusts in our Heavenly Father. In fact, the devil was not tempting Jesus to stub his toe. Where were they? Where was the devil and where was Jesus? Where did the devil take Jesus up to? He was at the pinnacle of the temple, maybe 50 to 70 feet above the ground. The devil was tempting Jesus to fall from the pinnacle of the temple, which would have killed Jesus prematurely. Well, I'm just stubbing his toe. And in killing Jesus prematurely, it would have thwarted the plan of salvation for mankind. So if Jesus had done that, in order to prevent Jesus' premature death, our Heavenly Father would have had to have intervened to save him from death through his angels. And as Jesus rightly quoted in his counter to the devil, That would have been deliberately putting our Heavenly Father to the test in a very frivolous and cavalier way, which is sinful. It would have been a sin. Although Jesus knew that he would have divine protection during his life, and he had to have because he had to live in order to be sacrificed for us at the right time. He did not use that knowledge to put himself in dangerous situations or act carelessly or frivolously in ways that would have endangered his life and health. That again would be a sin. We as called out ones should live the same way as Jesus lived. We are living our lives in order to draw closer to our Heavenly Father, but that in no way means that we will not experience pain or suffering or hardship in our lives. We simply do not live charmed lives. Now, the second point concerning why bad things happen to good people is point number two. We as called out ones are not promised health and wealth. We as called out ones are not promised health and wealth. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Many people turn to Deuteronomy 28 as proof of the promise of the health and wealth gospel. This chapter is the well-known agreement of blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience between the Lord and the children of Israel before they entered the promised land. And we'll begin in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on you and overtake you, and if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, and the fruit of the ground, and the fruit of the cattle, and the increase of your kind, and the flocks of your sheep. Blessed shall be your basket and your store. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and flee before you seven ways. 
The Lord shall command the blessing upon you in your storehouses and all that you set your hand to do. And you shall and he shall bless you in the land of which the Lord your God gives you. And the Lord shall establish you a holy people unto himself and as he has sworn unto you. If you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways and all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord shall make you plenteous in goods, in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your cattle, in the fruit of the ground, in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give to you. The Lord shall open unto you his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto your land in his season, and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend unto many nations, and you shall not borrow. And the Lord shall make you the head and not the tail, and you shall be above only and you shall not be beneath if you hearken unto the commandments of the lord your god which i command you this day to observe and to do them this is the heart of the health and wealth gospel if you obey god if you please him he'll give you all of these blessings and if you don't you will not receive these blessings and the health and wealth gospel, they're inextricably linked together. Now, brethren, a key aspect to realize here is that the health and wealth gospel or the health and wealth were the blessings of obedience in the covenant with Israel. This is part of the covenant with Israel, commonly referred to as the old covenant. The covenant with Israel was physical in nature and not spiritual. This covenant has physical blessings for physical obedience and physical cursings for physical disobedience. When Israel and Judah obeyed the Lord, they had rain in due season, bountiful harvests, protection from their enemies, and peace in their land. They were physically blessed. Israel was rewarded and blessed for their obedience with prosperity and with security. Brethren, these blessings were a part of the covenant with Israel. They are not a direct blessing and promise of our Heavenly Father in the everlasting covenant, commonly referred to as the new covenant. They're not part of the new covenant. The spiritual covenant with our Heavenly Father, which brings spiritual salvation, not just physical salvation, but spiritual salvation. The blessings in Deuteronomy 28 are not part of our covenant that we have made with our Heavenly Father as his called out ones. Nowhere in the New Testament are our Heavenly Father's called out ones promised an easy life a life filled with health, wealth, and prosperity. You won't find it. This is a key point. We are not promised health and wealth in this life. Not as called out ones. Our reward is not of this earth. Please turn with me back to Matthew chapter 5. And again, we'll read a small, another small portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 11. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11. Jesus said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And then in verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Now, our reward is in heaven and not on this earth in this physical life. It's a different covenant than the covenant with Israel that had physical blessings for physical obedience. Please turn with me to Matthew 16. Jesus proclaimed that our reward will come with him at his return. 
This is completely different in the reward that was listed in Deuteronomy 28. And we read this in Matthew 20 and Matthew 16, beginning in verse 24. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake will find it. For what is a man profited if he gain the whole world? The most successful person you can be in this whole world have all the riches of the world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And in verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. That's when we receive our reward. Please turn with me to Matthew 6. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus discussed our future future spiritual reward in contrast to any current physical reward. Matthew chapter 6. He was addressing the total hypocrisy of the Jewish leadership at the time. Matthew 6 beginning in verse 1. Jesus said, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father who is in heaven. Therefore, when you do your alms, when you give your offerings, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you do your alms, let don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your alms may be in secret, and that your Father who sees in secret himself shall reward you openly. That's in future tense. He will reward us openly, just not in this life. And when you pray, Don't be like the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. Again, future tense. Let's skip down to verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, don't be like the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that you don't appear unto men to to fast but unto your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. Again, it's future tense. It's not now. Again and again, Jesus announced that our reward is a future reward for us in heaven, and that our reward is not in this physical life. Jesus is bringing that reward with him at his return. However, living our Heavenly Father's way of life and obeying His laws do bring blessings to our lives. I'm not saying that obeying God does not bring blessings. But we live in an evil world ruled over by the evil one and his demons. And consequently, we are not promised and we are not assured health, wealth, and prosperity in this physical life due solely to our obedience to our Heavenly Father and to His laws. The third point concerning why bad things happen to good people is point number three. We as called out ones are promised 
hardship, and persecution. We, as called out ones, are promised hardship and persecution. You know, our adversary, the devil, is after all of us. He wants us to be frustrated. He wants us to be disappointed. He wants us to be depressed and weary with our lives. He wants us to give up. He wants to destroy us. He hates the plan of salvation that the Father has laid out for us. He hates us with a passion, just like he hates our Heavenly Father with a passion. He wants nothing more than anything else for us to fail. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and we'll read a warning from the Apostle Peter. It's not something we, we take lightly. We do not take our adversary and his demons lightly. And we, we read this warning in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Peter wrote, Be sober and be vigilant. Be on your guard at all times because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Our adversary, the devil, is constantly and continuously attempting to thwart our Heavenly Father's plan of salvation. He wants to devour us all, and he has attempted to do that throughout man's history on this earth with whomever the Father has called in the past. Please turn with me back to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, where we began in the message. Job was living a righteous life, and he feared God and he hated wickedness. Again, in Job chapter 1, and beginning in verse 1, we'll reread part of what we read before. Job 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one who feared God and eschewed evil. Skipping down to verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and the adversary came also among them. And the Lord said unto the adversary, where do you come where are you coming from and the adversary answered the lord and said from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it and the lord said unto the adversary have you considered my servant job that there is none like him in the earth a perfect and upright man who fears one who fears god and is shoes evil these are the very words of our heavenly father that job was a righteous man above all men apparently at that time and the story of job our heavenly father allowed the adversary to take away all of job's wealth to take away all of his sons and his daughters and all of his possessions he lost everything and ultimately, the adversary was allowed to take away his health. Job was smitten with painful boils all over his body, from head to foot. This was a test for Job designed by our Heavenly Father to further refine him and to bring a deeper understanding and relationship with God our Father. And in the end, everything and more was restored back to Job. But for a period of time, and at that time period probably felt like an eternity to Job when he was undergoing and suffering the way he was, Job did suffer immensely, even though God our Father said that he was righteous. Please turn with me to Luke 12. Luke chapter 12 where after talking to the multitude, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he proclaimed to them that he was not sending peace on the earth. He was not sending peace on the earth to his followers and for his followers, 
the called out ones of our Heavenly Father. We read this in Luke 12, beginning in verse 49. Luke chapter 12 and verse 49. In Luke 12, 49, we read, I am come to, words of Jesus, I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it already be kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with. How am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose you that I came, that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you, no but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. How many of us today are at odds with our own families? with our own friends because of our devotion to our Heavenly Father and to His Son, Jesus. Please turn with me to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Brethren, our predecessors in the faith had very different lives than what we have had in the faith. In Hebrews 11, we are told about the life of suffering, abject suffering that our that the many saints in the past have had to endure. And we read this starting in verse 35, mid-verse in Hebrews 11, chapter 35. We read, And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And many had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves on the er of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You know, these faithful predecessors in the faith did not enjoy health, wealth, and prosperity in their lives. On the contrary, they lived lives of hardship and destitution. The Apostle Paul endured numerous severe trials and afflictions in his life. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we'll read about his trials and afflictions. He lists them all out in writing to the Corinthians of the sufferings that he's, he had had to endure. And we read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 23, Paul wrote, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, and deaths often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. And the reason why it was 39, it was believed that the 40th would kill you. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered ship, shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own, by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, and in perils among false brethren. In weariness and in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, which comes upon me daily, the cares of all the churches. You know, in spite of all these sufferings, deprivations, and afflictions, Paul was still content. However, Paul apparently had a severe trial of a thorn in the flesh. 
We don't know what it was. It was never explained. The Bible just simply does not tell us what that thorn in the flesh was. But Paul really desired to be alleviated of this thorn in the flesh. And we read this in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, Paul wrote, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of the adversary to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. But he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, God our Father did not take away the thorn in the flesh that beset Paul. Instead, Paul was told that he should be content. He should be content in the suffering and that the grace of his heavenly Father was enough. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul also wrote that we all will suffer. It's a promise. It's a fact. We all will suffer in this life. And we read this in Romans 8 and verse 16. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. In Romans 8, 16, Paul wrote, And the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are our Heavenly Father's children. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, heirs of our Heavenly Father, and joint heirs with Christ, our elder brother. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we also may be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us when we receive our reward. The Apostle Paul wrote that we as called out ones and heirs of our Heavenly Father and joint heirs with Jesus will suffer with him so that we all will be glorified together. Please turn with me to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. The Apostle Peter wrote about enduring fiery trials that we encounter in our lives, and we shouldn't be surprised when we have these fiery trials happen to us. When something really goes wrong in our lives, are we just totally taken aback? How in the world would this happen to me? How could this happen to me? Peter addresses this in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Peter writes, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Again, we are partakers of the sufferings of Christ. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad and also with exceeding joy. When is his glory revealed? At his return. When is our reward? At his return. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul wrote that we will have troubled and perplexing lives, but that our Heavenly Father will also make us strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Very powerful verses in our battle for our spiritual lives. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7. Paul wrote, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's not about us. It is about glorifying our Father. 
and verse 8, we are troubled on every side. Does this remind us of what we're going through today? We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. When is that going to happen? At the return, at our resurrection, when we will receive our reward. Please turn with me to John 16. John chapter 16. On the last night of his physical life, Jesus told his disciples that they would experience many trials and many sorrows in their lives. John 16, beginning in verse 32. John chapter 16 and verse 32. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. John 16, verse 32. Jesus said, But the time is coming, and indeed is here now, when you will be scattered, everyone going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. And then he said, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. He's talking to us as well as disciples. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Please turn with me to Hebrews 13. Many members of the early church were imprisoned and suffered greatly for their belief, for their obedience to God's law, for their faith that they had. In Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 1, we read, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And then verse 3, Remember them who are in bonds, as bound with them, and them who suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Again, do we pray for one another? Do we hurt when, when others hurt? When they're undergoing severe trials. Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetous, covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he says, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Again, we're promised that the Father and Jesus will never, ever forsake us. Although the called out ones have always endured suffering and hardship, our Heavenly Father is our helper and calms our fears by our trust in Him. Brother, neither our Heavenly Father nor Jesus have promised us an easy life. It's just not a promise that he has made. Instead, Jesus and the apostles preached that we would live lives of suffering and deprivation. We, as called out ones, are promised hardship and persecution. The fourth and final point concerning why bad things happen to good people is, point number four, we, as called out ones, are purified by fire. We, as called out ones, are purified by fire. Please turn with me to Malachi chapter 3. And we'll read about our Heavenly Father and how he is like a silversmith purifying his silver. We read this to Malachi 3 and verse 3. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3. In Malachi 3 and verse 3, we read, And he, talking about our Father, shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. 
and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now from an article by Patricia Holbrook entitled Making Silver, a Reflection on the Heat of Our Trials, which appeared in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Patricia Holbrook wrote, writes, quote, One of the earliest methods of refining silver is called cupellation, a C-U-P-E-L-L-A-T-I-O-N, cupellation. And it, evolved, and it involves heating crude silver at extremely high temperatures until it is liquefied and adding certain substances such as nitric acid to help absorb the impurities. Once the pollutants are consumed the temperature is ju- and the temperature is just right, the liquefied silver should become as clear as a mirror. And according to tradition, when the silversmith can see his or her reflection in the metal, it is finished and it's ready to pour. Both the temperature and the moment to take the metal out of the fire must be precise or it could destroy the silver. For that reason, the craftsman must sit and carefully manage the process, tempering the metal until it is ready, controlling the heat and the timing, unquote. So the process of refining and purifying silver by a silversmith required that the silversmith pay totally close attention and remain totally focused on the silver in the fire as it is heated up. Once the process is started, the silversmith cannot get up for any reason. He can't leave the silver in the fire. He continues to sit by the fire, observing the silver as it is being purified with the high heat in the fire. The silversmith never leaves that position because if the silver were unattended, even for a short while, the silver could become too hot, resulting in irreparable damage to the silver. And the silversmith knows that the purification process is complete when the silversmith can see his own face reflecting back at him in the silver. Now, just like a silversmith, Our Heavenly Father never leaves us, even for a moment. He's always there. He is always there as our silversmith, purifying us until he himself can see his own reflection reflecting back to him. When he sees us, does he see himself reflecting back to him? Please turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And we will read about God our Father purging those whom he loves. We heard earlier Scott talking about chastisement. We'll read about God our Father purging those whom he loves in order to make them more fruitful. Not to punish them, but to make them more fruitful. Jesus talked to his disciples about the purging, this purging on the last night of his physical life. In John 15 and verse 1, John chapter 15 and verse 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. He prunes it away. And every branch that bears fruit He makes them healthy, wealthy, and wise. No, it doesn't say that. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, the Greek verb for purge in verse 2 is kathairo. It's K-A-T-H-A-I-R-O. It's Strong's number 2508. Kathairo. And it means to cleanse, to prune, to purify and make clean by removing undesirable elements. That's the meaning of that verb. 
We obtain the English words cathartic and catharsis from this Greek verb. This cleaning by removing undesirable elements is exactly what a silversmith does when he's purifying his silver. And that only comes through heat. But why is God our Father purifying us and pruning us? We read the answer in verse 8 of John 15. John 15 and verse 8, just a few verses down. It says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so that you shall be my disciples. We're, we are purified and we are cleansed, we are purged to glorify our Heavenly Father. Brethren, our Heavenly Father purifies us so that we bear much fruit so that he himself is glorified because we reflect him in our lives. When people see us, do they see the Father? Do they see Jesus in our actions and all that we do? People will see that fruit. If we are reflecting our Heavenly Father, when, we, when they see the fruit that we produce, they will glorify him. They don't glorify us. We don't produce the fruit for our own glory. It's for the Father's glory. Please turn with me to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Our Heavenly Father allows severe trials in our lives, even though we are obeying him, because these trials build character within us, the character that our Heavenly Father wants in his children so that they can be in his kingdom. That's the big picture. And that's the big picture that the father always has. His goal is to, for us to enter into his kingdom, not to have just a wonderful temporary life on this earth. In 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 6. 1 Peter 1 and verse 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations or tests, that the trial of your faith, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's when we receive our reward. Our Heavenly Father views our, he our fiery trials and tests in this life, things that we detest because they're painful. He views them as very precious to him because he knows that the heat from those fiery trials and tests will further refine us and draw us closer and closer to being like him so that we will indeed be part of the resurrection of the first fruits and will enter his kingdom. Please turn with me to Revelation 3. There seems to be no other way to be refined and to be shaped into our Heavenly Father's image without heat and without fire. The members in Laodicea, we're not wholeheartedly, humbly, and diligently following Jesus' example and our Heavenly Father's desire for us to be like Him. And we read about this in Revelation 3 and verse 14, verses that we all <laughs> almost know by heart. Revelation 3 and verse 14. In Revelation 3 and verse 14, we read, and unto the angel of the church of, La of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, you were just there. You just did the minimum. Your heart was not on fire for this way of life and for a deepening relationship with our Father and with Jesus. So because you, were, you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich 
I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And then in verse 18, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Here's the fire again. The purification process is the only way that we become purified. That you may be rich and have white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness does not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see as many as I love and rebuke and chasten. I, I rebuke and chasten. Exactly what Scott went over earlier. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Change. Change your ways. Draw closer to me and be refined in the fire and the trials that I give to you. Brethren, just like fire and heat remove impurities from silver and gold and other metals, fire and heat through trials and in sufferings in this life remove spiritual impurities from our spiritual lives so that our Heavenly Father can see himself when he sees us. Brethren, in today's message, we have explored four points on why bad events, bad circumstances, undesired and disappointing outcomes, sickness, financial hardship, and suffering are all part of the lives of the called out ones of our Heavenly Father. Many of our un unfortunate and difficult circumstances are the direct results of our own bad decisions and actions. I'm not discounting that. But many times suffering and hardship come seemingly out of nowhere when we are being obedient to his laws, when we are showing love to others, when we are trying our best to live his way of life, we still have sufferings. We still have problems. We still have fiery, fiery trials, temptations, and suffering. As we have explored today, there are reasons for that which are spiritual in nature. Point number one, we as called out ones do not live charmed lives. There is a belief by many in the past that since we are called by God our Father, since we are so special to him, since he loves us so much that somehow we live charmed lives and that nothing bad will happen to us. This is just not true. Even Jesus himself did not live a charmed life. At the end of his physical life, he was tortured, whipped beyond recognition, and brutally and painfully crucified on a cross. That is not living a charmed life. Would we ever believe that we would live charmed lives when Jesus didn't? Point number two, we, are, we as called out ones are not promised health and wealth. It's just not true that the called out ones of our Heavenly Father are promised health, and wealth in this life. The important aspect is that we, our reward is not in this life. Our reward is in the future. Our reward is being brought to us at our resurrection. Our reward is spiritual life. And the perspective of trillions and trillions and trillions of years in the future, and eternity in the future, our present physical lives of maybe roughly 80 years or so are just a blip in the timeline of eternity. That's what our Heavenly Father sees. He sees eternity. He sees the end goal. God our Father and Jesus our brother want us to be happy, vibrant, and tireless and joyous, but they want that for us for all eternity in the future. Point number three, we as called out ones are promised hardship and persecution. Again, as called out ones of our Heavenly Father, the followers of the same of the spiritual covenant, which gives spiritual salvation, followers of the new covenant, we are promised hardship, suffering, deprivation, and persecution. God our Father wants his called out ones to be in his spiritual kingdom as his children forever. 
And he allows us to undergo hardship and persecution to mold and shape us more and more like him and his son, Jesus. And point number four, we as called out ones are purified by fire. Just like a master silversmith, our Heavenly Father is refining us with fire and with high heat to remove the spiritual impurities within us so that when he sees us, he actually sees his face reflecting back to him. And in this refining process, we learn ever more deeply to love him, to trust him, to follow him, and to please him, and to always obey him in all things. Brethren, are you suffering? Are you in pain? Are you sick? Are you not prosperous in what you're doing? Are you tired and fatigued? Are you bewildered by trying your best to live righteously, but circumstances keep happening again and again and again that keep you from succeeding with your goals and your hopes and your dreams? Do we wonder at times, why are all these bad things happening to me when I'm trying to do good in my life, when I'm trying to obey the Father, when I'm trying to live my life like Jesus lived his? Do we ever ask our Heavenly Father, what in the world is going on? Why is this all happening to me? Do we find ourselves like Tevye and the Fiddler on the Roof, who when he was talking with God said, you know, I know that we are the chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? Again, our Heavenly Father does not promise us health and wealth in this lifetime. There are blessings, many blessings for following his laws and precepts. But there are evil forces in the world which also affect our lives. The lives of our predecessors in the faith were full of suffering, deprivation, and hardship. All the while, they were trying to live righteous lives and trying to please our Heavenly Father. Does it come as a surprise then that we, as their descendants in the faith, would also live lives full of suffering, deprivation, and hardship. So friends, why do bad things happen to good people? Because our Heavenly Father in His infinite wisdom and infinite love uses these bad events and circumstances in our lives to refine us, to purify us, to humble us, to mold us more and more in His image, until that special day that we will be resurrected to spiritual life and will be presented by Jesus to our Heavenly Father where we will live with him forever. I end my message today with my favorite verse in the Bible, which summarizes this message. Please turn with me to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. And we will read a very special promise to the called out ones whom we are. And in this verse, the word for God in Greek is hotheos. And it means the God. It's talking about God our Father. In Romans 8 and verse 28, we read, And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God. That's hotheos, God our Father our Heavenly Father, to them who are called according to his purpose. And friends, that includes you and me. If you would please bow your heads, we'll end services in prayer. Father in heaven, great eternal God, we do thank you so very much for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the ability to get together together here and Spanish Ford, as well as being able to connect via the internet. We thank you so much for your, your love, your kindness, your plan of salvation. We thank you for the reward that you are preparing for us. We thank you so much for giving us your truth. We thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. All, all good things do come from you. We just ask that you would please help us to be faithful to you. We know that you will correct us. We ask that you would
humble us and let us humbly take that correction to purify us so that we can become more and more like you and your son. We thank you for the message. We thank you for the fellowship. And again, we thank you for this day and ask now as we break for a meal that we, you would please bless the meal for the nourishment of our bodies. We just thank you again for all that you do for us. We thank you for your governance. And we again end this service and thanking you for it now. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.